Cool. Oh, here they come. All right, for those of you just joining now, welcome. Uh, I can see folks are starting to come into the webinar, uh, one of which is a smile back employee. Um, and so we'll let people uh, roll in for the next couple of minutes uh, and then we'll get started probably in two to three minutes. And as you roll in, um, if you have questions, and we'll go over all of this once everyone gets in, but please feel free to use the chat um, and send your messages to hosts and panelists. Um, and everyone, if you like, is always the best. Uh, or use the Q&A feature in Zoom. So it looks like we have a few more people coming in. And we'll get started in one minute and counting. It's really awkward two minutes, isn't it? I gotta figure out a better thing to do with this two minutes in the future. Jokes. Jokes. Well, you guys used all the jokes before we started. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> what did one British marketer say to the other British marketer <laughs> about their shirt? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so it is uh, 5.02 my local time, probably 4.02 a lot of people's local time, and even earlier in the day uh, in North America. Uh, I'm based here in Britain, or no, I'm not, in Berlin, um, and we have Paul, Dave, and Scott with us from the UK, uh, and so today we're doing something a little new with our Smileback webinar. We're going to try a panel discussion, um, and it's not going to be really on Smileback at all. We wanted to talk less about our uh, features and functionality and about our product and more about one of the most important topics and one of the hottest topics uh, in the MSP space today, which of course is marketing and sales. Um, there's a lot of talk about marketing and sales, I think everywhere right now, but it's especially interesting, I think, in the MSP space because there's um, a lot of projections out there that the MSP sector as an industry is set to grow uh, substantially over the next few years. However, uh, when you read sort of benchmarking surveys, say, put out by Kaseya, um, or you just talk in the community with MSP executives and owners, marketing remains a big challenge. Um, so we wanted to get some people here together so that we could have an interactive discussion um, about the state of the industry, about where we see things going, and about some of the key tips, tactics, strategies um, that you MSP owners uh, and employees can employ today. Um, so without further ado, um, I would just like to do a round of introductions. Uh, who's on the panel here today? So if you could say who you are and what you do, starting with, I'll pick the person closest to me, Dave Sutton. Dave appears to be frozen. He's doing one of those jokes. That's his, the keep the face yeah. still joke. <laughs> <laughs> so Paul, why don't you start us off? Yeah, uh, sure. So my name's uh, Paul Green. I'm the founder of the MSP Marketing Edge, and we're used by 494 MSPs all around the world. Uh, I'm Dave. It's... I run Wingman. Uh, we're Ooh. an MSP folks, Amy. Uh, I can see myself move. Uh, yeah, I run Wingman. Uh... You need IT support, Dave. <laughs> A lot of people can help you with that one. So, um, Dave, you, you... Oh, there we go. You're back on. You you go first. You, um, you, buffered, you buffered and they delivered it all in one go. Oh, okay. I could I could hear you live, and I was talking, and then yeah, obviously you guys couldn't hear me, so that's really strange. All right, uh, sorry, you, you 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 were oh yeah, we'll we'll start again. Sorry, this is dreadful. God, 
Uh, everyone moans about Teams, but Teams doesn't let me down. But Zoom obviously is today. Um, so sorry, I, I'm Dave. I run Wingman. We're an MSP uh, focused sales and marketing agency. Um, we support MSPs in uh, the UK, Western Europe and, and North America, uh, stitching together sales and marketing from uh, an MSP sort of, well, from an agency standpoint of making it sort of personalized and customized to you guys doing the hard work for you. So you don't have to worry about having the time and resources in-house to do it yourself. Brilliant. Nice. Thank All right, you. now thank over you, to you, Paul. Okay, thank you, Andrew. <laughs> uh, so my name is Paul Green from the MSP Marketing Edge. We work with 494 MSPs worldwide. We give them uh, marketing content and tools to help them. And I am an utter marketing geek. I live it, I breathe it, I sleep it. My family are so bored of me, which is why I love doing stuff like this, because I can talk about marketing to people who actually want to listen about marketing, and not people who just want to watch Netflix instead. And Mr. Miller. Hey, I'm Scott Miller from IT Rockstars. We help MSPs become the local technology leader, and we help them attract higher quality clients using our marketing automation and our premium content. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. And so before we dive right in, we just want to kind of take stock of where the people uh, in the audience are today. So we've just got a quick poll, which will help us understand where you're at so we can we can serve our answers that best meet the audience here. And then hopefully those who watch this on demand can also think for themselves, where would they locate themselves? So Yuria or Smileback webinars, if you could post the poll here, we just want to get a sense of how you would describe the state of your marketing efforts at your company today. Doesn't matter if you're doing the marketing or not. You know, are you crushing it? Are you good? Would you say you're neutral? You're neither good or bad? Are you bad or are you getting crushed big time? Uh, so if you all just want to quickly vote, we'll get a sense of where everyone's at and then we'll read the results back and dive right into today's content. Uh, I'm going to write that we are neither good nor bad. I can't vote. All right, Yuri, do you want to give us the results and we'll see what everyone put? All right, interesting. So we've got 0% uh, are crushing it. So I think that means there's a lot of opportunity on this call uh, for to give some, some ideas. Uh, three out of 10 say good. Uh, most are in the middle, neutral, neither good nor bad. So we could go either way with this conversation. And a few people are uh, getting crushed uh, big time. I'm sorry to hear that, uh, but hopefully after today, you might feel differently. Um, so let's kick it off. Dave, I'm gonna start with you. Um, can you give us just in your words quickly, what would you say is an overview of the state of marketing for MSPs in, uh, in 2021? Uh, I think that a lot are doing nothing, really, I suppose. Um, a lot of people are scared of, of diving in. They don't know where to start with targets, expectations, budgets, um, and perhaps are bewildered by it all, um, that they feel it's safer to do nothing um, than do something. Um, but I feel as though there are a lot of MSPs, at least a lot that we're speaking to, that are reaching that point where they're feeling as though I've exhausted my referral network. Uh, we can't rely upon referral business to continue to sustainably grow so we need to do something but we're not sure where to turn next uh, and i think the competition being as it is being quite vast uh, people feel as though they need to differentiate but again don't know where to start they feel as though we're exactly the same as everyone else what do we do to differentiate ourselves so there's a lot of thinking going on i think of where to go next scott are you seeing the same yeah, um, I see, you know, the the exhaust, it's complete, in complete agreement with uh, Dave, they exhaust the referral network and they kind of, they either, you know, plateau or have to move into, into a new location. Um, but it's it's also, I always feel as though, or what I see is, it can also be seen as a cost marketing, you know, and most MSPs are aware of this, that um, the, the IT support is seen as a cost for, from their uh, prospects. And the same is sometimes thought of as marketing, whereas it should really is really an investment, just like your technology is an investment, also. And Paul, what are you what are you saying? 
Yeah, completely, completely agree. And unfortunately, Dave, Scott and I all have very similar opinions, which doesn't necessarily make for a great debate, uh, but we do come at the, the same thing from, from different angles and different flavours. Something really interesting happened last year and, and has continued since then, which was that a lot of MSPs woke up to marketing. Um, things, you know, networking, the pandemic came in and networking, I mean, physically meeting people, networking suddenly stopped. And so those referral networks suddenly stopped and a lot of MSPs were terrified, you know, they did that two weeks of hard work getting everyone set up for remote working and then it was suddenly a case of well hang on where are we going to get new clients from and i think you know a lot of the big vendors have jumped into marketing big time in the last couple of years you know we, we see it, some of the major players i mean this is this is my second sort of webinar appearance today um you know and i've got a third one later on today there's so much now talking about marketing and offering marketing uh, um, um sort of marketing content and offering uh, marketing assistance so marketing is, is within the last two, three years has really rise on the average MSP's uh, radar. However, as Scott correctly identified, people don't really know where to start. They're scared of marketing. You know, the vast majority, Scott and I have, have competing businesses, both of which have grown enormously in the last couple of years. And the vast majority of, of I'm guessing, Scott, your clients, and certainly with my clients, they're technicians who have, have you know, started their own businesses. They've got teams now, uh, but they're not marketers. And, and they know, they realize they've got to look at marketing, not just as a, as a function, as, as a thing to do now and again, but but as a constant process, as an ongoing, never ending thing to do, because that's the only way that marketing works. And a lot of MSPs, they, they don't like marketing. It's a drag. In fact, it's interesting. Their attitude towards marketing is very similar towards their client's attitude towards technology. There, there is a real match up there. But the MSPs who do embrace marketing and who turn it into a constant system where something's happening every day, they do see results in the long term, which is it's really exciting to work with people and, and, and see them change their businesses in that way. Yeah. And so, I mean, a few of the things um, and all of you spoke to as a mindset um, as part of the challenge. And I can relate to that, too, as as a business owner and operator is marketing is not my strong suit. It's not what I gravitate um, towards to toward. Um, and as a result, I think some of that fear can be quite natural in the sense of, well, I don't know how to do this. Uh, it's not it's not my bread and butter. And you also mentioned that a lot of the vendors in the space, especially, you know, the big vendors like Kaseya, uh, uh, Dado, ConnectWise are doing a ton of marketing uh, and doing a ton of sales and really saturating the market with messages. Um, and so I'm wondering though, if you could speak to how does one as an MSP or a small uh, vendor like us respond to that where we don't have the big dollars, we don't have uh, the resources to, to compete and it can seem really like just out of our league to go, to go up, against, uh, up against the guys like that. Um, and also we don't want to inundate uh, people with, with sales calls all the time. We know everyone else is already doing it. Can you maybe speak to some of the, the opportunities there are um, and some of the, the different ways to approach it if, you, if you're not giant like these guys? Oh, sorry, I should say somebody. Uh, Scott, why don't you start? Yeah, well, I, I would I would suggest you know for what I see a lot of MSPs do when they get they get stuck into marketing is they try one tactic and they're not thinking of the wider picture. So they think there's okay, I've got to do this little bit that's marketing and I'll run some Google ads and then they go and get burnt by Google ads. Whereas they actually need to figure out where the marketing piece fits into their whole process of you know that prospect all the way up to winning the client and where that that marketing piece fits in. On top of that, and you know, if you're, you're talking about vendors having massive spend and just saturating, saturating the uh, all of the channels, think about what you can do different that no one else is doing. How can you stand out? How can you, you know, you could wear a ridiculous shirt like this today um, to try and stand out a little bit. But think about um, in your local area that you operate or your local niche that you, you operate or niche, how you can actually stand out in that marketplace. That's where I would come at this from. Um, and also the wider picture where the marketing fits in with your, your overall process. And Paul, have you seen some of your clients or just people in the space do something like that and, and have some success? I mean, it'd be great to hear just some of the small success stories um, that, that, that are out there so we can model ourselves off them in some way and, and have some confidence that that would work for us. 
Sure, sure. So the, 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 the loads of success stories and, and they've come from the clients who've done stuff. And I think that's the that's the critical thing is actually doing marketing. Uh, Scott's got it absolutely right there. Where he said a lot of people get burnt by Google and they think that this marketing thing is rubbish and it's, it's, it's terrible. Actually, no, you, you've got to put in place a marketing system. And that means not just throwing a thousand bucks at Google and saying, hey, let's see if we get some, some sales and being disappointed when you get a, you know, a guy ringing up saying his iPad screen is broken, which is exactly the business you don't want. Um, you have to put in place a marketing system. Because you've got to think about, not, it's not really about you, it's about the, the person that you want to attract. So if you think about the average business owner or manager that's in your town or in your niche, and they're the person that, that you most want to speak to, there's a whole series of different factors at play. First of all, they don't know what they don't know. So, you know, they don't know a lot about technology. They couldn't explain the cloud in a sentence that makes sense. Ransomware, they vaguely heard about it once and that colonial pipeline thing, but they don't really understand it. They don't know our world. They're not absorbed in our world, watching these webinars, reading our content, all of that kind of stuff. So when they don't know what they don't know, what we've got to do is, is talk to them not about technology, but talk to them about the things that are of interest to them, which is typically their business, uh, them, their goals, the things that they want to achieve. You know, no one actually buys technology. They buy the outcomes of technology. They want their staff to be more productive. They want their systems to help the business grow, not hold back the business from growing and all of this kind of stuff. So I think the, the people who acknowledge that and then put together a machine that takes someone from being a suspect a suspect is someone who's got their arms folded and they're like, who are you guys? I don't know anything about you. You take them from being a suspect and turn them into a lead. So a lead is someone you can have and should have thousands of leads uh, in your audiences, in your email database, in your LinkedIn, following you on YouTube, all of that kind of stuff. We should then turn that lead into an opportunity. So an opportunity is, is um, excuse me, turn that lead into a prospect. Uh, a prospect, of course, being someone that you're having a one-to-one -one conversation with. Qualify them to make sure they are an opportunity no one wants one man bands with two devices, really. We everyone wants, you know, minimum five, 10, 20, 30 user businesses because there's just more margin in that kind of business. And then you take them through to being a client and ultimately being a bonded client. The bonded clients are the ones that stay over 10 to 15 years. So from success stories point of view, I, I could throw a load of tactics at you, but actually I think the tactics are less interesting than the strategy. And it's, it's how MSPs go about building, you know, catching people's attention, building audiences of people to talk to, and then making sure that they're, they're having a conversation with them at exactly the right time. That's where the, the real power lies in your marketing system. I think just uh, also that point on tactics, um, a lot of technology, um, you know, MSP owners can get stuck at that tactics level because they're so used to the, the mechanical thing and the technology that the tactics are, uh, they're, they, they can trip you up sometimes. Davis, are you nodding your head as well? Do you want to add something on that? Yeah, I'm kind of taking it back a step, I guess, from, from what Paul said about knowing the audience and thinking about the people and their needs, challenges, desires. Um, it's knowing who they are physically, sort of identifying and quantifying the number of them. I think people, it's a, it's a common trait to um, misinterpret the size of the market, not only the number of seats that exist within the business, but how many companies are out there. Uh, I mean, yes, of course, within the UK, there's an awful lot of people, but, uh, and, and within every country, um, you know, everybody thinks that the market of businesses um, are, are far greater than what they are in their local area. Um, the opportunity is still reasonable, but don't overestimate it and be focused in that local audience. Go out and get data, understand what businesses there are, how big they are, what sector they're in. Only when you understand that and you've built uh, a framework of the audience you know physically who those companies are who the people are within the business you know then what makes them tick then how to shape your message to be focused around them uh, rather than just throwing stuff out there and hoping that it sticks know the audience first to tailor your message then you've got half a fighting chance of your message actually sticking when you start to push some some energy into your marketing and related to that messaging piece, and I think, Paul, what you were talking a bit about is knowing the prospect journey, the journey of the potential buyer and, and what that looks like 
for them, um, and this is a piece that Smileback actually knows a bit about, um, is social proof and Google reviews. That, that's that been something that uh, we've seen our customers take a great interest in. And also when we look at the market data out there is that the, the B2C trends around um, seeing social proof, ratings, those kind of things, they seem to be picking up a lot more in the B2B space. Um, so I'm wondering, Paul, have you seen, do you think that that is a, a trend that's important for a B2B businesses, MSPs specifically to pay attention to? And does having that social proof and Google reviews actually um, actually help the, uh, the, the sales cycle? Or is that, a, a, excuse my language, a whole bunch of bullshit? Uh, because, <laughs> you know, as much as, you know, we, we've seen yeah. uptake there, I think there's some legitimate debate out there around um, the, the efficacy of something, especially like Google reviews. Totally, totally. So uh, before I tell you about, if, if I'll give you an example of uh, a specific piece of marketing that uh, my members have used over the last year or so, which has worked very well, and, and any of the MSPs on this call are, are welcome to, to steal the idea. It's built around social proof. Let me just first of all explain social proof, because people bandy this around, but they don't understand what it is. So the, 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 coin, the, the term was first coined by uh, Professor Robert Cialdini in a book written in, I think it was 1984. It's called Influence. It's actually a really good book. It's, it's a thick book about the psychology of marketing, which for most people you know, is, is a book they'd rather not read. But if you can drag yourself to read it, you will learn about six weapons of influence. And Cialdini is a genius. You know, he's a psychology professor who focuses just on marketing. And he realized that all, all of us people, we think we're unique. We think we make decisions in unique ways and we're very different to everyone. And we're not because we were never built like that. We have exactly the same programming in our brains right now as we did 100,000 years ago when we were living in caves, hitting each other on the head with sticks. And you know, part of that is a, a sort of a herd mentality. One of the hardest things in the pandemic, I don't know if you guys found this, but, but not physically being able to see the people that you were friends with and, and touch them and hug them and all of that kind of stuff. And lots of people struggled with that because it's built deep in with us, within us. It's literally our programming. So social proof actually is actually a safety mechanism. If you were a caveman 100,000 years ago or a cavewoman and, and you noticed that everyone was running that way, you didn't stop to ask clever questions. You just ran that way as well because the chances were that something with big teeth and tiny little hands was chasing them and was going to eat them. And we've got exactly that same programming today. So social proof is almost the reverse of that. We see 20, 30, 40 Google reviews for your MSP, and the vast majority of them are positive with five stars. It shows us that other people like us trust you. It's as simple as that. Google reviews is a really effective way of doing it. Facebook reviews is a really effective way of doing it. It almost doesn't matter what platform you use because you can take all of these different platforms and do screenshots and put them onto your website and do all sorts of stuff. Pick, probably just go with Google or with Facebook, but getting reviews from real clients where it's their name and it's their photo and, and they're talking about your business in real language is so powerful. We've been running um, a sales letter uh, for, for we, we started back in March and we're on version four, three or four of it right now. And it's essentially, it's a four page sales letter that is full of social proof. And it literally says, and this is, this is the exact theme. You could do your own version of this, not you, Scott, because you're my competitor, but anyone else can, uh, which says, um, uh, how well has your IT support company been treating you during the pandemic? How well has your IT support company been treating you during the pandemic? And then the rest of the letter says, well, this is what our clients say about us. And, and my clients then paste on screenshots of, of um, uh, lots of reviews, whether they're from Google reviews or just people hitting reply to emails or whatsoever. And then there's a small call to action on the fourth page. And that letter is one of our best performing pieces of marketing, especially when married up with the thing that Dave is, is great at, Dave and his team is great at, which is follow-up phone calls. In fact, that, that letter performs okay on its own and it performs brilliantly with the follow-up phone call calling that letter. Now, the reason why it works so well is it's that abundance of social proof, but it creates a bit of intrigue. Now, for someone who's happy with their MSP, they're not going to they're not going to switch. That letter alone isn't going to make any difference. But for someone who's not quite as happy as their with their MSP as they would like to be, or who's you know within that three to six month period of thinking about switching, it, it works very deep inside because it's hitting them at a, at a very deep psychological level. So yes. Get as many Google reviews or, or just general reviews, testimonials, reviews, case studies, the three formats of social proof. Get as many of those as you can. 
Okay, so a resounding yes uh, to yes. the question. Of, I don't so do short group. answers. I, I don't know if you've <laughs> noticed that, Andrew. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, and uh, so I'm just going to assume that, that we all agree with you, uh, and then we can return to this. But maybe, uh, Scott, what what are some tactics that you've seen people use to get those reviews? Um, you know, we advocate net promoter score at Smileback because of the nature of the content that people leave is much better for reviews. Um, but I'm wondering if, if you've seen other, your clients are just out there in the marketplace. What have they done to, to increase their number of Google reviews or different social proof points since, uh, as Paula said, they're so important? Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm going to say you could use Smileback to to get those reviews. Um, there's there's various tactics that you can use. You could uh, you could build it into your your email automation with, uh, with your existing clients. That's one way that you could do it. But I think um, probably is you know what Paul's mentioned here. Um, he's got a sales letter and he's using the social proof in his sales letter to pretty much sell what he's selling. Um, there are other ways that you could use those reviews, and it's not just having them on Google or in a sales letter. Um, what I'm seeing more and more now is people that are using their reviews and basically testimonials, feedback on their service in their advertising, in their paid media campaigns. So places like Facebook, um, places like the Google Display Network, they're actually just posting up like a testimonial of their business. Um, and it's potentially something that they're working into the retargeting so that if there's potentially a prospect that's been on your website, they've kind of checked you out, then they're going to start to see those testimonials um, appear across the web about your company. So that's, um, and this is me getting caught, caught up in the tactics again, as I said, that it's very easy to get caught up in. Um, but um, that's, uh, yeah, that, that, that's some of the, the, the things that I would definitely use it for. And the other point I probably just mentioned is, if you if you are getting these reviews on Google and places like that, make sure they're on your website as well, because all of your marketing is really trying to do one thing is get that person, that prospect back to your website. So if you can have them there on your website, not only is it going to be helpful for that potential website visitor, you're going to rank higher in the search because people like or platforms like Google and uh, Microsoft Bing, they're looking at your website. And if they're seeing fresh content, fresh reviews all the time, well, guess what? You're gonna you're gonna start to rank higher. Nice, and uh, I like the website design piece too because that that's an important question. Is once those prospects start getting to your website, you know that's where they're finding information about you specifically. And Dave, I think your firm um, has some experience in website design. Are there any specifics or high level strategies that that you advocate around website design specifically um, for MSPs and, and maybe to you know Paul's point earlier that you know the people who are buying the services don't necessarily know a lot about the services um, so you're trying to not sell technology but sell services to them yeah that's a very common trait I think people like to focus on what's easy when generating content for their website and look at um, what do we do and maybe how do we do it but it needs to be the reverse who are you talking to what are their needs challenges concerns desires why have they reached your website today um, because they've got uh, you know probably the majority of the market are already outsourcing you know as Paul said you want to catch people when they're dissatisfied with their current company and often that's a, a, a either a considered decision over a long period of time or a knee-jerk reaction so we've been let down we're going to hit Google and find someone else um, so you want to be talking directly to them and what concerns have they got what's special to them in their industry what are the commercial and operational drivers for them um, that technology can assist with um, before you then get into uh, what do we do and, and how do we do it um, but of course marketing is also about telling stories so using things like the MPS and, and case studies and testimonials um, will help you stand apart because few MSPs will put it out there on their website um, to directly talk to that market and, and show, you know what, this issue, we're familiar with this issue because we've resolved it for someone else. Uh, here's the pain it was causing them. Here's how we've helped. Uh, and here's the net result. Here's the outcome for them. And here's how they're raving about us and uh, and, and the proof in, in the pudding of, of how we've actually helped them overcome that. Um, so that's my advice of where to focus on from a content perspective uh, for websites that's missing on probably 99% of, of MSP's websites. Interesting. Um, and to, or sorry, Scott, did you want to pick up on that point? Oh, no. 
Oh, okay. Um, and so I've got, this is kind of a question more um, for my own uh, than, than necessarily for MSPs, but I'm sure uh, they can relate to it is I really find it easy to understand how I can use content to speak to my customers, because I understand my customers' needs from Smileback, I understand my customers' needs from the product, um, and you know, we've been producing a lot of really good content at Smileback, but mostly for our customers. Uh, and we don't really, I would say, know how to get it to prospects and how to utilize it more with prospects. Um, and so I'm wondering, you know, is is content more of a customer, existing customer thing and, and, and marketing to your existing customers? Or is it also something that should be used in, in the sales journey? And, and what are some of the, the strategies or even just questions one should be thinking about when they're trying to leverage uh, content as a sales driver? Paul. <laughs> Sorry. <that> one. <laughs> um, you, you, if, and let me open, let me make this more about MSPs than Smileback because it's, it's as relevant yeah. to Smileback as, as MSPs. Um, if you're not generating content for your website and content to educate your audiences, and I'm talking about prospects and, and leads, I'm not talking about clients, you are literally missing a trick. Um, not, not missing a trick, missing the trick. Content marketing is the it's the, it's the best way. Do you remember earlier we were talking about building multiple audiences and building a relationship with them? And then, and then maybe, maybe that was a previous webinar. I've done a lot of webinars today. Um, there's, there's a three-step marketing strategy I talk about um, a, a, a lot, clearly, on lots of webinars. You, 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 to, to get more leads, you build uh, multiple audiences. So things like your email list, your LinkedIn uh, you, your podcast, YouTube, all of that kind of stuff. Then you build a relationship with them, and that's all about content. It's all about educating them and entertaining them at the same time, edutainment as that's known. And then finally, you you commercialize those audiences, and you do that by sending them sales letters, calling them, all, all of stuff like that. And um, that middle bit is the bit that can last years. Because someone who is thinking of switching from one MSP to another, they might not think about that. Well, put it like this, you, you know, most MSPs have insane, insane retention. Most MSPs have still got customer number one or customer number two from 15 years ago. And part of that is, is because it's, it's hard for people to leave you. MSPs benefit from something called inertia loyalty, where it feels easier to stay with your existing MSP than to switch over to someone new. Now, that's also what slows down your sales cycle. So you have a tiny window with any particular prospect, even if they hate their incumbent MSP, there's still only a tiny window now and again, at which you can actually have a genuine, decent conversation with them. And you've got to remember about switching over. And you've got to remember that people don't make these buying decisions using their brains. They make their buying decisions using their hearts. Something we said earlier is that these people don't know what they don't know. So they cannot cognitively decide if you're a good MSP or a, or a bad MSP. Just as we, Andrew, cannot decide if Smileback is better or worse than any of its competitors, because cognitively we don't know. So what we do is we go at it from an emotional point of view. We make an emotional decision. And content for prospects and leads is pretty much the only way that you can build a really good relationship with hundreds and thousands of people at a time. There's a book I'm going to recommend, and I'm sure many everyone on this call has read it. It's called They Ask You Answer by Marcus Sheridan. This is the book to read about content marketing. Now, I only actually read this myself last year, and I couldn't believe it. It's taken me so long to get around to it. It's been on my bookshelf for years. But the guy uh, talked what I mean, everything he talks about is is B to C marketing, business to consumer marketing. Interestingly, though, he's gone and set himself up with a B2B marketing agency, which uses exactly the same methodology as in this book. So if, if you can bear reading this book about marketing, although it is one of the most interesting marketing books you'll ever read, They Ask You Answer is, is the answer to why must you invest in long-term content. And I believe actually for most MSPs, that is your five to 10 year marketing strategy. Uh, do you have anything to add to that around content? I know you're you're in the same space. Yeah, uh, I just in complete agreement with Paul, really, more than anything else. I haven't read that book yet, um, but I, I think probably Paul mentioned there that the content that you're putting out as an MSP has to entertain and educate. But I think on top of that, what the content should be doing is positioning you um, uh, above your competitors in the local market space. Because if there is a prospect that is actively looking, and as Paul mentioned, 
there's that really tiny window when they're maybe actually looking at other uh, you know IT support firms or technology firms around the area you've got this tiny window and how do you differentiate yourself how do you position yourself in a way um, compared to everyone else and it is through your content you're going to find that if I go to 10 MSPs locally and I go and hit their blog and what they're talking about and their timelines you know, how can I make it better uh, for my MSP? And also, Andrew, uh, the question that you asked about how you can get your content into the hands of your prospects, well, you're in a really lucky position because, you know, you're marketing specifically uh, to MSPs. So if you're if you are an MSP in a particular niche or niche, um, then you can very much identify with data where a sales letter like what Paul's doing has to go to. You've got a mailing address and you can put it there in the mail to that potential prospect. And I would always, you know, and this is where I always start is the prospect. Who are your ideal clients and customers? Get a list of them. Um, and, you know, David, Dave mentioned, I'm maybe going to agree, uh, disagree with him a little bit here about buying data. I would actually be building the data yourself. And what does that mean, building the data yourself? Can you expand a bit on that? Okay, well, first looking at your local market, the types of businesses that you're wanting to attract, the ones that are a particular size, not the, the one or two man band with the iPad issue that Paul mentioned, um, but you know, whatever, whatever um, your ideal prospect, what does that actually look like? And then get, going off to places like Sales Navigator and filtering using the search in Sales Navigator and other platforms to find those specific um, those specific businesses and the people within those businesses, and you'll easily identify them. It's hard work, but you know I, you could you could take the easy option of buying data. Um, but if you go down this other route, um, you can be very focused and targeted on getting your content into the hands of your ideal customer. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we call that lead mining, and we've had a lot more success building those lists actually than we have buying the lists, um, because often the data is just junk. Uh, but Dave, if you've had some success um, with with list buying, can you explain uh, the other side of that, how, how that works and how that can be successful? Yeah, I, I refer to it as buying a list, but um, yeah, I, I wouldn't work in that same way of traditional data houses now, which um, post GDPR particularly, uh, their shelves are already sort of 90% empty now. Um, so um, in some cases you might get quality, um, but um, you certainly won't get quantity anymore uh, and you need a mixture of the two. So uh, we've got some fairly expensive tools that we use to acquire data now. So we, we use some of what Scott mentioned of, of relying upon LinkedIn. That's the only place you're going to find the right people. Um, but there's other tools that go beyond uh, traditional industry codes. Um, I know in the UK here, we've got SIC industry codes, which are years out of date and miss many of the organizations that exist nowadays. Uh, they simply don't have an industry sector code. So um, fi find lookalikes, take the websites of the companies that will be a perfect fit for you um, and build lookalike data or, or get the help of, of an agency to source lookalike data um, that is formed around industry sector the size of employees um, and from there you can then start to build out your messages you you then know something about them uh, and probably starting with your existing client base is a good place you know you've got accountants law firms manufacturers whatever they might be you know something about them and 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 i would say go beyond the the things that you take for granted the automation that you put in to cut out some manual data entry that you just take in your stride and it's you know oh that's just what we do but actually that could have been revolutionary to that business and save them hundreds or thousands of man hours so that's the sort of thing that you need to be shouting about um, you know we answer the phones quickly and you know we're proactive support everyone says that really think about what you've delivered into those specific business settings um, and you do that with the help of your audience then you can be far more relevant with the message Brilliant. Um, and I've got a couple more questions, but I wanted to just pause there and see if there's anyone who wanted to jump in um, in the audience uh, through the chat or the Q&A, or I'll just keep firing away, but I don't want to miss an opportunity if um, someone has a question they want to ask, they don't want to save it until the end. OK, no. Um, so uh, but you mentioned agency there, Dave, and obviously that's what you do. And all three of you um, are, are marketing shops in some form or another. And I think one of and, and I used to actually be a consultant in the, the software space. And I find one of the the main 
barriers to say taking on uh, an agency, a service provider, is you just don't know what that's going to look like. What if you've never done it before? What does the relationship entail? And so I'm wondering, yeah, Dave, if you could start just kind of walk through what what is it like without without being a total sales pitch uh, to uh, you know to engage with an agency on this kind of stuff, and what should you expect? Um, what kind of relationship should you be uh, preparing yourself for? Yeah, um, a long-term one, I think, is the first thing, as as Paul already said. Um, it's a long-term investment. Uh, I think the first thing to get right that that we've only really cottoned onto recently that we're, we're pushing education out on is, is accountability. The first thing is when an end customer outsources their IT to an MSP, a lot of them will think they're outsourcing the accountability for their IT, which ultimately isn't the case. You know, you're not in their business, so you can look after most of it. You can manage it and lead it for them, but you're ultimately not accountable for it, you know, because you're not there, you can't control it. And it's the same with an agency. Um, As the owner manager of the MSP, you're still responsible for your growth. You control the brand message, the relationship with customers, your proposition. So you can't outsource that accountability. So you have to be intrinsically involved with your agency in the message, in the audience, what's going out, understand the execution, because only then will you understand how to measure it and where to look for the ROI and ultimately how to follow up on the leads that the marketing generates and close and win new business. Um, So that's the first hurdle or to get over. Um, the second one, I think, and our proposition being a full agency is a bit different to what Paul and Scott do, but clear deliverables. Um, those guys and some of what we do is, is a, a, a menu, a list of services, so you know what you're getting for your investment. Uh, but also, if you're looking at the agency route, particularly where things like telemarketing are concerned, you need to understand um, that everything needs to be formed around numbers. And most agencies won't do that. There'll be fluffy you know, uh, people that are their head in the clouds and they don't think about the numbers, the size of the audience, what's the percentage return on that? How long is that going to take uh, in terms of months of effort? How many hours of effort is that? How many touch points is that? All of these numbers stack up. So uh, you should then have some proof to understand when will I see a return? Um, and usually, setting the bar lower on the, what the expectation is and how soon will those leads come to fruition and anybody that's promising oh yeah we'll start doing some activity for you and we'll line up 10 meetings for you next week never going to happen because uh, it's about playing the long game and that's usually what people get wrong uh, when they dive into a relationship with an agency that doesn't understand the sector paul scott anything to add there um I'm not a massive fan of agencies. I think Dave Dave does a great job um, getting to know Dave a little bit over you know a couple of years. And on, there are some great agencies around. We've you know we could fling around some names. Um, the reason I'm not a big fan of agencies is is exact all the things that Dave talked about there. I agree with. And and that, the problem with the agency model is once one you, you're fine. It's it's almost like IT. You're fine when it's sort of two, three, four people. It's as the agency gets more and more successful and more and more people get bolted on. The you know the, the, you get to a point eventually where uh, agencies are committing the heinous crime of the the experienced really good person at the top is is doing all the pitching winning all the business and the work's being delivered by a twelve year old down at the bottom of the organisation which that's actually the the big agency model I think they use thirteen year olds but you, you get the idea so it's it, I used to run a marketing agency myself you know I, I sold it five years ago and I swore I would never ever. Uh, do that again predominantly because it's just a stressful way to make a living i mean look at dave dave's actually only 18 but he, he's just he's got the body of a <laughs> weary 40 year old man because of his demanding clients whereas scott and i are in our 60s and we look young and fresh um but no it's i think i think um, the, the biggest issue is is that um it's it's what was what did you say dave it's the, the phrase of devolving responsibility what was the phrase uh, yeah it's the accountability isn't it it's it. outsourcing yeah. that accountability yeah yeah it, it's it, you know if, if you took on a uh, a client and for your MSP and they said to you on day one, oh, we're so glad you're here. We haven't got to worry about, we can click on any emails we want now. Uh, we haven't got to worry about ransomware or anything like that because you guys are just doing all of that. And any MSP would go, whoa, no, hang on. This is a, this is a two-way partnership. We, we'll train you. We'll put the appropriate security in, but, but you've got to do some work and, and we've got to do some work. And it's the same with the marketing agency. And it's just too easy for a busy business owner to hand the marketing keys over to an agency and then three, three six months later, get pissed off because they haven't got a client. Um, when it is, in, you know, it's actually quite difficult to win a new client in, in you know, three, six months, just, just like that. 
Um, and so Scott, I'm going to ask you a question actually slightly different here from uh, from one of our attendees, and it's an anonymous attendee, and I can tell why from the question. Um, and it reads, as a tech who has been thrust into marketing, uh, what do you recommend for marketing fundamentals? And so maybe uh, you could speak to uh, the question um, and then also perhaps offer some advice around uh, why it's probably not the best move to thrust that role onto somebody um, who either didn't put their hand up or that's not actually what, what their expertise and, and their experience is in. I would probably say go off and do at least a 12 month stint in sales uh, for the MSP as opposed to jump straight into the marketing side of things because it will give you an, a, an overall wider picture of what's going on within the business. So from a technical side, there's some things that you're doing. And that's where I came from myself. I was a senior systems engineer. Um, there's certain things that you're, you're doing in the business. But then when it comes to the sales and winning the client, there's just things that you're not aware of and how, uh, how to speak to local or business owners or prospects that are looking for your business in your marketing. So if you can get in the sales action, that could be quite a scary prospect. Um, so that that would be what I would suggest. If you can't do that, or if you don't want to do that, then my main advice to you is don't get bogged down in the tactics. Now we mentioned how you can quite easily get burnt on Google ads and things like that. Think of the wider uh, the wider picture and the process and where marketing fits in and all of the other steps in your business. So I talked about looking at prospects, coming up with the ideal client list that you want to actually do business with, build that list, and then start producing marketing that you can get into the hands of that list. Um, and then with a sales process, actually follow up with people that have been sent stuff in the mail or have seen your marketing content. So, um, and that's be going into the tactics again, and it's very hard as a tech from a technical perspective, not to get kind of tripped up there. And I, you know, I think that, and that's great. Thank you. I, I think it's just interesting though, the very idea, and you know, and I don't want to speak for the, um, the person who asked the question, but the word thrust, right? Like you thrust something onto someone yeah. um, and, and it is something that it kind of, speaks to what we talked about at the very beginning to come full circle, right? Is there's this fear around marketing. We know it's important, but it's not being given um, the attention it deserves, perhaps, if, if you really want to do it right. Um, so say you're an internal advocate in your organization. You've watched this webinar. You want to go to your bosses and say, no, I think I think we need to um, we need to make the case for this, Dave. What what are the kind of things that that someone can do internally to kind of be the the advocate uh, for bringing on um, more marketing resources? Yeah, it might take a very big drum or a very massive loud hailer, I think, in a, in a lot of businesses to get that point across. Um, I, I think. Um, well, I mean, the, the preaching to the converted to a degree, outsourcing some of it, you know, the MSP sells themselves as don't do it yourself in house, outsource it, you can never afford the expertise uh, yourself for IT internally within your business. And, and it's exactly the same with the sales and marketing. Although the big difference is there's a there's a point in the sales cycle that you can't have outsourced. And, you know, with our guys, when, when we generate leads and we set appointments, we have to hand that over. You know, we can't go and attend the meeting and close the business on the MSP's behalf. So someone still has to pick that up and be the champion internally within the business. Uh, and they still have to be the one involved with knowing the customers, knowing the message. So uh, as much as people don't like it, there still has to be that level of accountability and involvement. So to come back to your question, uh, look at perhaps what the business has tried in the past and the reasons why that's failed. And that might be throwing a lot of money at Google, getting a generic telemarketing agency to do some calling. Often there will be small pockets of activity over a short period of time that may have had, you know, there are some telemarketers out there that say we want several thousand pounds in a short window. And that, that doesn't work. You know, it needs to be little and often activity. It needs to be a machine, a conveyor belt of, of multiple touches using different marketing mediums. That's the reason why it didn't work, because it was short term mindset. So use that as the well, that's what we tried before and it wasn't part of a bigger strategy. Here's what we need to do instead. Get the audience and just use those little touches, small expenditure over a longer period of time to get the results uh, and committing that smaller amount of money 
every month might be uh, the safer place that the owner of the MSP would feel comfortable um, committing to something that's, you know, a, a lower amount. It doesn't feature at the top. You know, if, if it's the same amount or less than perhaps what the PSA is costing every month, then they might feel comfortable with um, with spending that money. But if it's near to the wage bill, then it's probably going to scare them off. Yeah, nice. And I think that's, if I mean, it's always hard to get budget, um, but I can say from our experience at Smileback, we started doing content. Um, you know, we started doing our own content program. Um, I kicked it off because I used to be a journalist. So I thought, okay, I can do this. I know uh, how to create content. I don't um, for for businesses, right? That's a completely different, um, you know, way of doing things. And I think even on these webinars, like I still am a journalist when I'm doing this. Um, and it's a whole different thing. And, and Rory, who who's our growth lead and, and is in the audience today at one point when we did hire an agency that started churning out content for us. And we started with a small amount of budget just to test it. And as it worked, we grew it and grew it. And he said to me one day, he's like, well, it's just so nice to be able to send this to someone. Here's the brief, you know, two days later, we've got the content. It's good. There's nothing to do. It's so much more efficient. You know, it's not taking up my time where I'm, you know, should be focusing on other things. And it was kind of just being able to, to take little pieces, see success, grow the relationship, take a few more pieces, see success, and for us to get comfortable with it, where we really realize, oh, this is why you outsource um, these things. And, and for us on that journey, especially with content, um, we just learned so much and, and it became such a successful program for us. Um, and and you know, as, as you said, we committed long-term and just have been building and building and building this relationship. And, and that's, really, that's really worked for us which isn't really a com uh, question it's more of a comment um are there any other questions from the audience i'm not sure if we were supposed to be 45 minutes or an hour um but if there are no more questions we can wrap up uh, with a few closing words um so just while we give uh, anyone who who wants to to ask a last minute question um perhaps you everyone could just you know, give your little spiel on what you see next um, in the industry as it, it's always changing so much, just kind of a cool uh, prediction uh, for the near future around marketing and also um, where people can get in touch with you if they want to follow up with you directly. Of course, we'll send out um, the recording uh, and some more information to all of our Smileback list uh, after this webinar. But yeah, in the meantime, Scott, what, what, what do you see coming next and how can people reach out to you? Um, I think there's there's a, a divergence in the MSP sort of marketing, uh, what your MSP is actually doing and where it stands in the marketplace. And I say that is because you're not only providing IT support now, you're not only providing support for hybrid working, you're having to think of, you're having to implement solutions that are optimizing the business digitally, taking analog processes and bringing them into a pre-COVID world um, and you're doing other things with data, potentially, th things like Power BI, analyzing the data within a business and bringing it to the attention to make that, you know, that competitive advantage that you could potentially be bringing to your clients. So really, how are you going to differentiate yourself with all of these new technologies that are coming, you know, that they're in place now and they, they keep changing and evolving. So that's, I guess it's kind of more of a, a question that I'm putting out there. Um, and that's, that's we provide the answer to that IT rock stars is because we make you the local technology leader. And when someone thinks about a sort of technology issue, they're going to think about you. And if they want to be the local technology rock star, how do they get in touch with you? Check out itrockstars.net. Oh, okay. I've been put it in the chat. Wonderful. Uh, and before we get to uh, Dave's uh, prediction, Kyle has given us a question. Um, and, and so maybe Paul, you can take this. What are some key sales mar and marketing strategies for entering and trailblazing a brand new market where you have no current clients? Oh, great question, Kyle. A uh, really good question. And I think we can actually lean back on something we were talking about earlier, which is social proof. 
So when Carl, you're entering a brand new market, but the kind of the only people who really know you're brand new to that market are, are you, you know, the, the prospects and the leads, they, they, because they're not keeping track of all the MSPs that are around. It, it's more of an internal problem for you than it is an external marketing thing. So you can take all of the social proof that you've got from another, uh, you know, another state or county or city where you are, you can use exactly that social proof in your, in your new market. Um, I, I think you've then just got to look at how can we get the numbers up quickly and by numbers I mean how can we talk to as many people as we can quickly um, um, my view on buying data is somewhere in between Scott's and, and Dave's um, in that I think buying data can be a great way to get started quickly although I'm also a big fan of scraping Google which is you know has is it legal is it not legal but there are people on Fiverr that will go and scrape Google Maps for you and, and just at least give you access to to, to quickly to, to who are the, the businesses we want to speak to around here you can build a LinkedIn offering um, depending on how far away it is from your from your uh, other operation you can look at you know different kind of web pages aimed at that market or, or even different websites there's, there's lots of things that you can do but the number one thing you mustn't do is go in thinking oh, it's a brand new market we've, we've got to get started here you you, you pick up the momentum that you've got from your previous market and you shove that into the new market. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. And while we've got you talking, what's your, uh, what's your prediction and how can people get in touch with you? Sure. So I think we all know that the, the world of MSPs and the world of, of IT changes every you know, seven to 10 years. Uh, you know, we go back 10 years and we were all talking about, everyone was talking about break fix. And of course, now it's managed services. We can all look forward and see managed security services is, is going to be a big part of it. So I have no idea what's going to happen technology wise. I think we, we can all see that the change is speeding up. What I think is, is going to really affect MSP owners is there's, there's going to be quite a lot of change in the way that marketing happens. So there are going to be some cool new marketing tools that come around. AI, genuine proper AI is going to create some opportunities. Uh, for people there's going to be I mean already we have virtually every tool you could think of you, you think about oh well, if only I could do this somewhere there's a tool that someone has written to do it and if they haven't created a tool for it yet it's because it can't yet currently be done so I think we're going to see uh, I mean we already have a plethora of marketing tools there's going to be a hundred times the amount of marketing tools there's going to be some very clever ones but none of these are really relevant to the average MSP unless they create the marketing system. What I think we will see in virtually every marketplace is we will see one or two MSPs dominate their marketplace. Now, it could be one of these super MSPs. In, in virtually every Western country, we're seeing super MSPs start to form. They're growing by acquisition. They're buying MSPs in, in every city. And you know we're going to start to see these really big MSPs. If one of them gets really good at marketing, that's when a lot of MSPs are going to be in trouble. The, the marketing agency I sold five years ago um, worked with dentists, veterinarians, and opticians. And the reason I'm in the MSP market right now is because I had a five-year non-compete, which only ran out this year. And actually, I prefer this market. This is much, much more fun market. But the opticians market, where I used to work, was decimated in the UK. And, and the, the company that decimated it has done exactly the same job in, the, in Australia by a company called Specsavers. And you know, your, your little local optician will typically turn over half the amount of cash that the, 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 the same Specsavers store in the same street next door would turn over. And that's not because Specsavers is better at glasses and stuff than the opticians are. It's because they're so much better at marketing. And that's their, their real dominant power is being marketing. So I think I think that there's, there's a number of different ways this could go. So if, a, if one super MSP in your area gets really good at marketing, it could dominate the entire area. But, but I think in, in every area that, that there will be one or two dominant players in the years ahead you know we look at things like they ask you answer which is essentially a playbook for dominance it is an utter playbook for dominance and most msp i must have recommended this to a thousand msps over the last year or so how many of them have actually read it probably very few how many of them have implemented it well i know that about 10 of my clients have implemented it and they're working through it and they're you know they're, that's only the first step in in a hundred steps um, but it's a real opportunity is to, is to get so good at marketing and to make it so systematic that your business you know literally is unbeatable in five to ten years time because you utterly dominate your marketplace now, in terms of how to get hold of me, um, so our core product is called MSP Marketing Edge, which is mspmarketingedge.com. I also have an educational site, which is Paul Green's 
mspmarketing.com. And what I'll do, actually, in fact, this answers the question for the, for the marketing fundamentals. We have a free book, which is called Updating Servers Doesn't Grow Your Business. And if you go on to Paul Green's mspmarketing.com, uh, I will send you, physically send you a, a printed copy of this book if you're in the UK or the US, because that's where we have piles of books waiting to be sent. If you're anywhere else in the world, we'll just send you a very nice PDF. And that's Paul Green's mspmarketing.com. Brilliant. Thanks, Paul. I know my takeaway is have props. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Dave, the last word? Yeah, I think uh, if anybody's familiar with the phrase, um, the king is dead, long live the king, uh, I think is the case with uh, with IT support. Uh, people still buy it as IT support, as they did when it was break, fix and, and manage services. And it will still be the case where it's evolving into management consultancy now around technology. Um, that education, that being involved more intrinsically in the business operation beyond just fixing things when they break. Uh, that's the next reinvention that I think is coming is people, people kind of get used to the idea that vendors are competing and offering support directly themselves, poor quality support, but but it's cheap. Those that buy on price will move towards that. Um, those that realize that technology is more of an important driver in their business will realize that they need a partner that's more of a management consultant than just a support help desk. Um, so I think that's the reinvention, but people will probably still buy it as IT support. So it's reinventing the message with still calling it the same thing, because that's what people will probably still Google. Um, that's the way to go. That's what people need to focus on, not just being an insurance that will be relied upon less and less as tech gets more reliable, um, but as a consultant that will get under the skin of their clients' businesses and really get involved operationally, commercially, um, uh, around those sorts of things that are unique to them, You know, especially in regulated industries and things where uh, that is a, a big driver that can influence how the tech fits in. Um, sitting there and waiting for the phone to ring when things are broken, those businesses will, will die off. Um, so that's what's coming next. And that's the trick that people need to switch up their, their marketing to tackle. Uh, and you can get in touch with us uh, as he's dropped into the chat. Uh, we are wingman.co.uk. Brilliant. Thanks, Dave. I like that as a final message. So I want to thank everybody um, who's on the call right now for attending and participating in the webinar. Uh, and I want to thank everyone who's going to watch this on demand afterwards. Um, thanks for your attention. And of course, thank you, Dave. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Scott, for being with us here today. And thank you to Eben and Yuria for hosting the webinar. Uh, and I realize I never introduced myself. I'm Andrew Wallace. I'm the Managing Director and Chief Product Officer at Smileback. Uh, so you can also feel free to reach out to me or the team anytime. Um, I'm Andrew at spellback.com. And I think Eben would prefer it if uh, you booked a call on his Calendly or sent a message to support at smileback.com. We're always happy to do customer consult calls and it's actually one of our KPIs. Um, so you're helping the team by reaching out for free support and consultation. So thank you again, everybody. And we'll look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Ciao. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, everyone. Bye.